So here we find this account of Moses and his dealings with the children of Israel and God's dealings with the children of Israel. And if you look in your bulletin, you will find that the title for today's message is Faithful Ambassadors for a Loving God. And so I would like to at least quickly to define faithful. Now I know that you probably know, but since it's the title of the message, I want you to know where we're going. And if we look here at the definition of faithful, we'll see that faithful is loyal, constant, and steadfast. That's probably what most of us thought of when I said the word faithful. When I say faithful ambassadors for a loving God, we think, yeah, faithful, loyal, true. You know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, veer away from that. But I want us to understand also the second part of this definition. True to the facts or the original. It's not just important that we are faithful in presenting God to the world. It's not that we're just faithful in doing it constantly, continually, and not giving up, but that we do it right. That we are accurate in the way that we represent God. Because as representatives, we have an obligation to not just be continually representing Him, but representing Him as He is. And nothing less. Moses cared how God was represented to the world. And as, as God had spoke to Moses, as we read in chapter 32 in Exodus, that God said, look at these people. They have set up a golden calf. And they're saying, the golden calf has led them out of Egypt. <coughs> and, and literally, this golden calf is taking the place of God, their deliverer. It says, let me, let my, my anger grow against them, that I may destroy them and give you a new people. And this is how Moses replied in verse 11. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. And so here at this time, Moses begins to defend the Lord. This morning, I would like to defend the Lord. And I'm going to be able to do it for a long time because I usually have a timer up here and it's not here. So that means I can go as long as I want to. But I want to defend the Lord too. And I hope that you want to defend the Lord as well. I hope that you would say, I want to defend the Lord. I want to defend His name. And Moses is saying, this doesn't make you look good, God. First off, I would like for you to know that God is good. And He didn't need Moses to make Him better. But I like to think about this for a moment, just like any dad would with his kids. Sometimes he will raise his hand or begin to start to do something that he never intends on doing, but to motivate his child. If you're a parent, you've done that. And I believe that God is saying, I'm going to raise my hand to destroy these people for the express purpose of Moses growing and, he, and him able to step out in his love for the people and his love for God. Because he says this, <clears throat> he says, he says, why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them? He says, I don't want people, the Egyptians, this are the, these are the enemies of the Israelites. He says, I don't want them to look at you, God, and think of you as someone who would bring his people out to the desert and then kill them. <coughs> he says in verse 13, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants. To whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants. And they shall inherit it forever. So Moses begins to remind God of the promises that he made to Abraham. He says, hey, you know, you made a promise that of this great nation and as much as the stars in the sky. And so, you know, you have, and so he's defending the people, but he's also defending God's honor. It says in verse 14, so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people, and he withdrew his hand. Now, this is, might be a difficult passage if you don't kind of know the way that parents work. You may wonder, would, was God really going to do this, and Moses changed his mind? Surely, I, I, I mean, I don't believe so. 
I believe that this was an exercise for Moses and that Moses was not the good one here that had to reel God in from doing something bad. But God was was bringing Moses as a leader to a place of great love and compassion for both the people and for God. So after this, we see that Moses comes down. He sees all this happening. God told him what was going on. He sees all this happening as you continue to read in Exodus. And he sees it in the golden calf and he takes the stones, the Ten Commandments, and he throws them on the ground and he breaks them. You're familiar with how it goes. He goes down there and he has some wrath. The Bible says his wrath grew against the children of Israel and he punished them. Read about it. We won't get into it for the sake of time. But he punished them, but he didn't wipe them out. And so after that, he goes back up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments again. Not 20 commandments, it's the same 10. The Lord just wrote them again. And so in Exodus 34, in verse 6, we read, And the Lord passed before him, before Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. God did not just come to this place because Moses helped him get there. Are you following me this morning, church? God was always long-suffering, gracious, and merciful. And he's declaring this for Moses. He says that the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. <clears throat> if you want to know what I think about that, we can do a side on that. I don't want to get down. I just want us to focus on what he's saying here. He says, I am so merciful. I'm so forgiving. I remove sin. I take it away from people. God is declaring who he is. And this is someone that we need to present to the world. That is so often failed. And sometimes people don't present this loving, gracious, long-suffering, forgiving God to the world. This is who we need, just like Moses wanted to present to the Lord, the Lord in such a way. We, like Moses, are on a mission to declare the goodness of God. We are on a mission to declare the goodness of God. Are you on a mission this morning? Are you on a mission today? Are you on a mission in your life to declare the goodness of God? Or are you just on a mission to, to ride through this life and make sure you make heaven on the other side? Or are you on a mission to declare the goodness of God? We are church. We are His delegates. We are His ambassadors. We read in 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 18, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. The Bible says we were separated from God, our Creator, because of our sin. And God says, but I have a plan. I say, I want us to get back together. It says, verse 18, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So we have that as ambassadors. The ministry of reconciliation say, hey, God wants to get back together with you. <coughs> that is that God, verse 19, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses, showing mercy, hallelujah, and forgiving their sins and blotting out their sins. This is the work of this merciful God. And it says that, he, that, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And it's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors, delegates, representatives for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. Are you, do you feel like that? I pray that you would raise up this morning, raise up in your life, and realize that God's trying to plead through you to save and reconcile the world. This somehow to me represents some sense of urgency of how important it is. Where are we at in our lives that, that this is not the definition of who we are? I want us to think about the Lord's walk, walking around inside of us trying to plead through. Pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. 
Now this is a statement from, from uh, uh, Paul, like the apostles, to, that we're pleading, but this is something that we should be doing. We are pleading also. So you'll find in your bulletin, God wants ambassadors who testify of His great mercy. God is a merciful God who's long-suffering, who forgives sins. And this is a great responsibility and obligation that we have to present to the world a God who is merciful. And as ambassadors, church, listen to me, individual out there, ambassador, delegate, you sitting in that seat who has a job to do as an ambassador, represent God as a merciful, merciful God. Represent Him as a merciful God. The essence of evangelizing is being ambassadors. We all feel, you know, I know that we're supposed to be um, evangelizing the world. Well, evangelizing, you know what that is? That's ambassadors. We are ambassadors. We're representing God. When we go and we teach everything that there is about Jesus Christ, when he said, go make disciples, teaching them everything that I've taught you, you are sent out as ambassadors. But let's consider something else. In addition to representing His great mercy, let's consider something else God wants us to make known about Him. In Ephesians chapter 2, we begin reading in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love, huh, because of His great love with which He loved us, He's rich in mercy, and, and because of His great love, it says that in which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, not like after we got better and I made myself good and worthy to God. No, while we were dead in trespasses, it says, made us alive together with Christ. Meaning, he did it. We did not earn it. He did it. We were dead and he made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved. And raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This doesn't mean somewhere off in the future. We are now sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We are in heavenly places. That means otherworldly. Other than this just world. We are residents in a kingdom with a king. And that's where our citizenship lies, not where it's going to lie. It's where we lie right now. And we are sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show, meaning moving forward, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God wants to demonstrate his grace. And he wants that to be known. He wants everybody to see it. And so much for this ghost grace it kind of happens behind the scenes and it has no impact or change in people's life. That does not bring any glory or honor to God. His grace is like this. And he says in verse 8, For by grace have you been saved through faith. It means your faith, His grace. You, by His grace you have been saved through your faith in that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Meaning you are not doing this, but something is being done. And that's very, very important. And why we must read the next verse that says, For we are his workmanship. What is that? A word that has to do with something being accomplished. It's not some ghost transaction that happens behind the scenes for your salvation. No, it's something that happens and it produces a result. Is why James says that faith without works is dead. Your faith, his grace is going to produce something right here. And so Paul is not disagreeing with James because Paul gets right into the works, but he says it's Christ's works. It says this, now then, uh, uh, verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Four good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We need to redefine grace to line up with Scripture. For too many years, grace has been, for so many people, somehow God's blind eye to their sin. That is not what God's grace is. God's grace is something that's active in you, enabling you to be set free from sin and walk in righteousness. It's not a ghost transaction. It's something that produces something that we need to be accepting, embracing, and loving. And you know what? I find that I see His grace in my life doing and working effectively and building something as a master craftsman, Jesus Christ is accomplishing something. And he's building something and it amazes me. Matter of fact, 
we find that God's grace is amazing. So if you look in your outline, you'll see that God wants ambassadors who testify of His amazing grace. And how does one testify of His amazing grace? By just walking around saying, I've done a lot of bad things. I do a lot of bad things, but I'm still going to heaven because God's grace. They don't testify of anything. A real testimony of God's grace who says, boy, my goodness, I used to do this bad thing and that bad thing, but now I find that the Lord is in me enabling me to do good and holy and right things and righteous things. That's how we testify of God's amazing grace. God wants us as ambassadors to represent him in this way. We need to represent him in a way that people can see how, how awesome his work is in our lives. They don't look at you and say, oh, you're awesome. They say, my goodness, God is awesome. Look at what he's doing. If that's not happening, we're not being good ambassadors. We need to be faithful and demonstrating as an ambassador delegate to present to the world how God is so merciful and how his grace and what it happened, what it does in the life of the believer. Now, I would like for us to consider another thing as an ambassador that God wants to make known about himself. <clears throat> now, I want to take a walk with you. <clears throat> Not a physical walk. I just want you to go somewhere with me this morning. Somewhere there might be a little bit uncomfortable, but I want you to go there with me and hang out. In a minute, you might hear something and be offended. Just wait a little bit. You might get more offended, but just wait. <clears throat> do you believe, let me ask the church this morning, do you believe we should do what the Bible says? I think that's, anybody disagree with that? Uh, I think it's universally that we agree that we should do what the Bible says. Let's see something what the Bible says. Luke chapter 14, you don't have to turn there, you can if you're quickly. Um, but we're going to put it on the screen for you, and we assure you this is going to be word for word from the text. Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, let us read. Jesus, this is red letters. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brother and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. All right, you, all you who said, we're going to do what the word of God says. We're going to do what God says. This is what Jesus says. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. He closes that thought out with. <clears throat> How many of you good, faithful Christians are out there hating your father and mother and your, your brother and your sister and your children. Ah, right, you being faithful to that there this morning? Hold on, I told you it was going to get uncomfortable. Don't leave yet. Are we going to be faithful? This, I mean, this is pretty direct and clear. It says it right there. To hate your father and your mother, your wife and your children, your brothers and your sisters. Now, we ought to be faithful to the word of God and start doing that. We need to start hating them. Hating our wife and our, and our brother and our sister and children. There's some confused looks. I want you to be confused for a second, for only a second, though. But something inside of us says, no, that can't be right. I mean, I don't know about you. Somewhere, when I first read this, I'm like... No, there's something, something, right? Is anybody that says, I heard what it says. Did it, can anybody at least agree with me? That's what it says. All right. I got a few people saying that's what it says. Does anybody think here that might not be what it means? Okay. I got a few people saying that might not be what it means. All right. I'm challenging you this morning. Now, this is what they say don't do when studying God's word. It's the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. That's just some fancy words. I'll just uh, sum it up by saying this. You're supposed to read the text and let the text read to you what the Bible says. You're not supposed to take your preconceived notions and read them into the text. But I pray that you did when you read Luke right here. I pray that you said, 
That is not God. I pray that some of us in here know the Lord well enough to know that I know that's what it says, but that cannot be what it means because it does not line up with who I know God is. And I pray and hope that people in this church, people in every church, the people of God, that they would believe that God wants to, to get you to know him so well. That even if you're reading in the Word of God and it doesn't line up with who He is, now I'm getting dangerous here, it doesn't line up in appearance at least, that you should be able to say, wait a second, I know God. I believe He wants us to know Him personally more than He wants us to know the, the Scriptures. Oh my goodness, I'm in dangerous ground right now. I'm, I'm going to double down on it. I believe the Lord wants us to know Him better than we know the Scriptures. Because somehow we've taken pieces of paper and ink and leather and made them a God. And God says, do not replace me at all. Now, I don't believe in the word of God as being fouled. I don't believe that it's messed up and I don't believe that it's wrong. But I believe that sometimes we will, we will hear, we will read, and we'll, we'll think that something is saying something. But somehow, because of what we know about God, we say, that can't be what it means. But we kind of agreed in here for the most part. That we conclude, and we must conclude, that what the text says isn't always what it means. And that's why we study. And that's why we acknowledge this. That we have some barriers. It's the old adage, language barriers. We know that the New Testament was written in Greek. And so when we read in, in, in the English today, it's been translated and matter of fact, a lot of what we read now has been translated years and years ago. And so the language we speak to now, like if you, some of you are reading from the King James Version, that's an entirely different language that we don't even really speak today. There's just some words that we recognize and some of them we don't know what they mean. So there, we, some of us are reading the King James Version and we have a lost in tr translation doubled. And so I would like to propose to you this morning that we need to be careful because sometimes what we're told the Bible says isn't what the Bible is actually saying. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you that God expects us to hate our neighbors, or hate our, our, our husband, our wives, our mothers, our brothers, our sisters. Nobody really believes that. But I don't know why they're not teaching it. It's right here in the Word of God. You say, well, of course, because that's not what it means. Well, there's a lot of things that the Lord doesn't mean that people are teaching right out of the Word of God. That is not true. A lot of it. You probably can't imagine that anybody would take people down a journey teaching them that God expects them to hate. But there has. There are some groups out there, and they're li literally legally called hate groups. They call themselves Christians, and they actually take texts like these to try to define what God feels about people. Although this text was direct and clear, it defies what we know about God. It's a dangerous thing to propose to you as a preacher to propose to you that God wants you to know him enough that whenever you read something or you hear something, he says, but is that me? Because there are certain things that I know about you, some of you, that if somebody was to say, this person did this or that and the other, and I'd be like, I don't care what you said. I know that person that does not line up with that person. Now, I've been wrong about people, but God's characteristics is, cha is never changing. But there are people that I, I, I've found that re regardless of things that were said, I was glad that I knew them better than to believe the nonsense. God wants you to know him better than to believe the nonsense. And this is important. Why is it important? I'm going to just at least try to clear this up before we move on. Lest anybody think, well, what we'll just deal with that. The Bible said it. I'm still stuck on that. Okay, good. Let's clear that up. First off, without getting too deep into the Greek... The word love and hate is different in the Greek than it is for us. Matter of fact, the Greek in a lot of ways is so much richer in its, in its descriptive and its, its uses and its vocabulary. And, and so we have use love. We, one word covers a bunch of them where they have like a bunch of different words to cover love. But just in love and hate general, in, in the Greek, it was not like a black and white issue like we think of. Love and hate was like a direction, um, almost like in, in, in going from hot to cold. All right, so if we had a really hard freeze, 
And it was cold. Last year we had a, some cold days. And if it was hanging out in the 20s for three or four days, and you saw the weather forecast said it was going to get up to 33, everybody's like, oh, it's going to be warm tomorrow. You're like, warm? That ain't warm. If, we, if I was to tell you tomorrow it was going to be 33 degrees, you'd be like, whoo, that's cold. Now, wait a second. It's all relative is my point. It's relative. And that's the way that, the, the, that they used hate and love. It was a direction. It was a direction. It wasn't like all the way to this end or all the way to that end like we think of today. It's a direction. It has to do with preference. Matter of fact, containing this, concerning this teaching, Matthew also records this teaching. I don't believe it's the same teaching. I don't believe that Matthew misquotes Jesus. Jesus went around constantly preaching and teaching. And I believe Matthew records another time Jesus is teaching. And he says the same thing with the same conclusion at the end. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, let's read this. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his own cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. See, the same conclusion, the same teaching. Now, they were not hung up like we were, like we were this morning because we have certain words that we use differently. They knew what Jesus was saying right here. He says, you have to make sure that on the scale of love that God is premier. He's at the top. And when you move down, the Greeks would call that hating. It just means it's going down. It's going up or going down. He says, when you go down, he says, you got to make sure that you go down hate, I mean, going down, that's all it means. You're still loving them from our definition of love, but it's less. And so the word hate in the Greek is best defined sometimes, if you look it up in the Greek, as love less. That's really what it means. Oh, well, why didn't they just say that? Well, sometimes they do. Some of your versions might actually say that. But the, the important thing is that we, we understand that there is a language barrier and we knew to get around it by what? Because we knew God first. And that's okay. Because too often people have been told, what you think you know about God, don't listen to it. Listen to the traditions of men. Continuing. As ambassadors who testify of God's goodness, we recognize that wasn't Him. He doesn't expect us to hate. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite writers, he's been dead and gone for a long time, and his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, he says this, and I want you to listen closely to this because I believe this is true and therefore of the Lord. He says this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I want you to sit on that for a minute. What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It really kind of lets us know where we are when we think of God. Do we think of him as a merciful God? Do we think of him as a loving God? Do we think of him as a good, good father? A sacrificial father who's, who's there for us and loves us? Who's magnificent and beautiful and we're in awe of his majesty? I mean, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It continues later in this very chapter in the knowledge of the holy chapter one, if you're interested he says this, and I'm, boy, this is deep. Let's go deep for a minute, okay? It says, among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry. We probably understand that. There's not, there's not hardly anything that's more offensive to God than idolatry. That's the Lord answer it, I'm sure. Among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry. For idolatry is at a bottom of a libel uh, is at bottom a libel on his character. Okay, a libel to his character. So here, let's continue because I was thrown off by the finger that ringing. Normally it doesn't, but it got me. I wanted to know who it was. Who was it? So at a bottom a libel on his character. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than He is. That's what happened with Aaron. Remember, you know, in in the Israelites, they said, "This is your God that led you out of the children of Israel." This is this golden calf. That's why idolatry is so bad. He says, that's not me. You're, you're misrepresenting me. Anything that is less than me, that you believe about me, is not me. And therefore, if you're worshiping that, you're worshiping an idol. Uh-oh. Ouch. Okay, be careful. All right. He says, the idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than he is. In itself, 
this is a monstrous sin, and substitutes for the true God, one made after His own likeness. Meaning, what you think about God. If it's not true and accurate about Him, you're worshiping another God. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time quoting Tozer, but I do want to close out his thought here. He says this, Let us beware, lest we in our pride accept the erroneous notion that idolatry consists only in kneeling before visible objects of adoration. Sometimes we think, I don't bow and worship these other idols. And what he's saying here, and I believe is true from the Lord, he's saying, don't think that that's the extent of idolatry. He continues. And then that, that we as civilized people, we're free from that. It says the essence of idolatry, the real spirit, the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. We need to know who God is. We need to know who he is. How does Peter portray God? In 2 Peter chapter 3, we read, in verse 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing. Huh, make sure you know and you remember this. Don't forget it. That with the, with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Peter is dealing with those who are in, in the church, and even those who are mocking people, uh, saying, hey, the Christian is like, where's your God? I thought he was coming back. Hello? He says, don't look at your watch. God's not on that time zone, that time schedule, and not that that system. He says he has his own time. And he says, the Lord is not slack, verse 9, concerning his promises. He's, he's faithful. Whatever he said he's going to do, he's going to do. As some count slackness. But he's long-suffering. He hasn't come back yet because he's long-suffering. That's who God is. Represent him accurately, church. Ambassadors represent him as a long-suffering God. He's long-suffering toward us, not willing, meaning what God desires, willing, his will, his desire, the heart of God revealed right now before you in the scripture. Listen close, peer in, reach in and look at the will and the desire of God and his desires that, that any should perish. Know God, know him. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we also know from the scriptures that not all will come to repentance and that many will perish, but it's God's desire that none of them would. God's heart, know his heart this morning. I wanted to talk a little bit about perish, but we'll come back to that. Peter's representation of God is a far cry from how God has been represented in America. In our hell and fire and brimstone and preaching and teaching about eternal conscious torment, that's a far cry, really, from what Peter is saying. The OG, original gangster of hellfire and brimstone preachers, was Jonathan Edwards. On July the 8th, 1741, in Enfield, Connecticut, he preached his message titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And a quote from that message is he describes God and God's relationship with us in this way. He says that God that holds you over the pit of hell, much in the same way as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you, hates you, and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as, a, as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is, a pure eyes, he is of purer eyes than to bear to have to Look at you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. <clears throat> this sermon, you can go get it in its entirety, had a great response. The people were tripping over each other to get to the altar. But I, I, I truly challenge in my heart, were they running to God or were they running from something? Were they running from something? You know, a lot of the world has rejected hellfire and brimstone preachers. Where are they? Where are they at? You hardly find them anymore. Why? Have they compromised the gospel? Or maybe they've come to the conclusion that this long drawn out description of eternal conscious torment is not necessary for evangelizing. So let's walk that out a little bit. Eternal conscious torment. This is a phrase, a man-made phrase. You don't find this phrase per se in the scriptures. It's the, the, the concept and the belief that when you die, if you don't go to heaven, you are in eternal 
conscious torment. You are awake consciously for all eternity in a fire that, that is never quenched and is, and is tormenting day and night, day and night, day and night. And so this hellfire and brimstone preaching was very effective at getting people to run from hell but not run from God, not run to God. And so I say this morning that, is that what we really need? Do we need that? Because it can't be necessary because nobody's preaching it anymore. I don't care. The best of your preachers out there, look at it. They're not drawing out this eternal construct. They mention it, drive by. <laughs> They'll say things and they move right on. Why is it? For one, people don't want to hear it. I believe that two, for some of them, they can't say it and preach it with conviction. But we'll come back to that. Peter wants to make known to us, to his readers, who God is. We read in verse 9 in 2 Peter 3 and 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but He's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus says this to Nicodemus in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The most quoted scripture and all the Bible that we learn from the time we're little is one of the most prevalent and most mind-blowing scriptures if we were to truly take it and breathe it in. In here, we don't have any mention of eternal conscious torment. What we have is the mention of perish. And so now we will look at the definition of perish quickly. The word perish in the Greek is to destroy. Destroy utterly. So just reading that without having somebody come in and tell us any other thing would find that, that Jesus is drawing a contrast between God giving you eternal life or destroying you. Let's just stop there because that's where Jesus stops. We can go other places later if you want to. But let's just stop right there. The contrast is being destroyed or having eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's very, very important. Now, it's true. That destroy, this word in the Greek, can be used to, to define something that's just ruined. may not be utterly destroyed, it's completely ruined. But sometimes, and I believe here, it means what it says, utterly destroyed. What God really wants us to do as ambassadors is represent how loving He is. How merciful, how gracious He is, and how loving He is. And that's why John 3.16 is so important. That's why I love the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. How deep, how deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son, John 3, 16, to make a wretch huh, His treasure. What does God want here? He wants us. I'm sorry, Mr. Edwards, Jonathan Edwards. I can't buy into that dangling thing that has God just sitting there hating us and so disgusted by us, but one who says, hi, one, I'm not willing to should perish. I want to snatch them. I want to save them. I want to rescue them. How love, how much love to make a wretch his treasure. How deep the Father's love. So if you look in your outline, you'll see that God wants ambassadors who testify of his deep love. I've always honestly been uneasy with the doctrine of eternal conscious torment but i was like hey that's what the bible says so i just got to deal with it you know you know that's what happens you know i've been told that's what the bible says and so i just got to deal with it even as i grew in my relationship with the lord i began to know him more and more and better and better i began to know him it began to conflict in my heart and my mind about the god that i know about one who would put people in hell to torment and torture them for all of eternity and i could not grasp it but i accepted it i said because that's what the bible says well that's what the bible says about hating your brother and your mother and your sister and your child and all that things sometimes and what we said earlier, sometimes what it says is not what it means. And I believe there's a lot more things than just that love-hate thing that has been lost in translation. But I'll at least say this. At some point, I felt the Lord press in my heart. He says, you know that ain't me. So I began on a journey. It was a journey that took me years. 
As I began to realize and, and study and research and find out that, that eternal conscious torment was not the only option for the evangelicals and that, that despite what people had told me that if you don't believe in eternal conscious torment, you're a heretic and you're a blasphemer, I found that's not true. That's not true. I found that in the church world, there are people who don't believe in eternal conscious torment who are faithful. And that's why in, in, our, in our little uh, card in the seat back, it says these are some of the things that we're okay if you don't agree on. There are people in here that believe in eternal conscious torment. I understand that you believe that. I used to believe that too. I believed that most of my life. Matter of fact, this was my thing. I was like, if there's no eternal conscious torment, and this is maybe where some of you are in here this morning, so I want you to know I was right there. I responded in the same way. If there's no eternal conscious torment, why would anybody get saved? Okay, I know some of you are thinking about that, so I want to at least close up with this thought. When I first visited that, that was my knee-jerk reaction. Who's going to get saved if there's no eternal conscious torment? And I believe the Lord began to weigh on my heart. Tell me, please tell me, Steve, that that's not the limit of my glory. That the only choice people have, the only way they would choose me is because of the fear of eternal conscious torment. Am I not beautiful enough to be chosen without that being hung over their heads? Surely not. Surely not. So here's this thing, and I'm, I mean, I'm just saying this is from me. And so, you know, you know Paul said, this is from me, not from the Lord, whatever. You know, I, I, don't, I don't expect people to quote me, but you can quote me on this, and I'll stand behind it. If the gospel isn't presented in such a way that Christ is worth dying for without the threat of eternal conscious torment, we have failed as ambassadors for Christ. We must not, shall not reduce the glory of Christ, the beauty of Christ, to simply the alternative to eternal conscious torment. God wants us to love Him and love His Son enough that if there was no conscious, eternal conscious torment, we would still choose Him. Tell me, church, please tell me that we have not reduced the glory of God to something that's only better as opposed to eternal conscious torment. We don't need it to evangelize. The glory of God and the beauty of God is enough to present the gospel we can present him as ambassadors that he's a merciful God, a gracious God, a loving God. And anybody that wants that love will respond to that love in such a way that they are willing to die to get it and to spend eternity with him because they want him, not because he just beats out the alternative. Come on, we've got to re represent God better than that. We are not longing for an escape from torment. We are longing for him as an inheritance.